summer night of Christian and Michigan. Right, live? Can you hear me? Not yet. One more time. <laughs> With Yuli? I'm green. Good morning. Welcome to Summer Lab Christian and Missionary Alliance. This morning we're going to start with an announcement from our elders board. Good, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, hi, my name is Rob King, and uh, just on behalf of the elders board, we wanted to uh, just again uh, encourage everyone about the whole issue around masks. Uh, those of you who have been following the news, uh, there's been a two-week lockdown in the greater Vancouver and Fraser Valley areas because of the incredible increase, sadly, in COVID. We are doing better in the interior, the north, the island. Uh, of course, we want to keep it that way. So, certainly the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Henry, is very much encouraging us to use masks, and we want to convey that as an elders board to everyone uh, today. And again, thank you for uh, for that. I've seen a number of people doing that and we just would really continue to encourage us to do that so we can keep us all safe, healthy, and uh, free of COVID. So, and we're looking forward to worshiping with you this morning. Thank you. And yes, I take my off when I'm reading because my glasses fog up. I'll put them back on when I sit down. So this morning I'm going to get the scripture reading from Job chapter 16, verses 19 to 21. Even now my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high, my intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God, on behalf of a man he pleads with God, as a man pleads for his friend. We're not in this alone, Jesus is praying for us, he's the one in control, and he's the one who's going to get us through this. Let go of the word of prayer now. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your protection. I pray as the world goes through this time, that you will bring stability to our hearts, that we will be at peace and trust you, because you are the one in control. And now we will uh, turn this over to Jim and Anna, if you'd like to stand for the worship singing. We're ready to go. Good morning. As you know, Oh, no. 
stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. song or, or comparing as we, as we look at this and and, uh, and talk through uh, and Psalm 23 is what is what Rick has been preaching through for us. Um, one of the things that, that we can so easily do is lose sight of the things that God sees, that there are so many messages that we get from so many places within the world telling us to feel a certain way, to think a certain way, to fear something, to um, fight something, whatever it is, and that we can uh, lose sight of what God would say to us and what, what He sees. And there's this story uh, in Second Kings that I'm always reminded of, Second Kings chapter 6, when I think of uh, seeing things as God sees them, as, as there are so many levels to, to, to His plan and His activity and the things that He's doing we so rarely know. Uh, the prophet Elisha is... Um, surrounded by enemies. They're unhappy that he keeps telling uh, the king of Israel um, where the where his enemies are going to go. <laughs> uh, Elijah has been given knowledge from God and he's like, oh yeah, they're going to be over here and they keep uh, thwarting the king of Aram's plans, I think is, is who the, the, the Aramean people. And uh, and so they then go to surround Elisha. And Elisha's servant wakes up uh, in the morning and, and they are surrounded uh, by the enemy. And the servant goes to Elisha and says, like, take a look, this is terrible. <laughs> Bad things are about to happen, uh, which I very much relate to the servant, um, because those are the eyes that I see through, I think, so often is uh, the circumstances around me. Uh, but then Elisha, um, I, I can't, I don't know if he says it specifically to the servant, but, but he says to God, like, would you open his eyes? to see what reality is. And as Elisha prays, the servant's eyes are open, and in the hills are chariots of fire, surrounding and, and in more number than, than the enemy. And Elisha then, even as the enemy comes to attack them, just prays that God would blind them, confuse them, and, and that's what happens. And, and, and everything works out, which is not necessarily always the way the the story goes. Um, but we see so limited, uh, we are able to see so much of the, the limited things that are in, in ahead of us. And, and um, I know that I am very subject to that, and that it is so important um, that, that I learn how to see things the way that God sees things. And so as we say, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, would you, God, enable us to see things, to know things, to understand things uh, as you do and to have the same priorities, Father, uh, as you.
are trustworthy, that you are present, that you are with us, that in the moments when we are drowning or anxious or frightened or uncertain, that you are not. That you see beyond what we see, and God, would you help us to know that you are good and trustworthy, that you will not abandon us, that you will not betray us, that as we look for you, as we cry out to you and say, Lord, I need you, that you are faithful to answer, you hear us, you love us, and you move, Father, on our behalf, and for the love of your creation and for the love of your people. Thank you for uh, your goodness and your kindness. In Jesus' name. Amen.
or you can visit us on the Facebook. So we're delighted that you're here and worshiping with us. Bear with us as we navigate all of the things related to COVID. Um, we're aware of what's happening within our province and our primary um, concern is that we do everything we can to keep one another safe. We're grateful that we can social distance here in this room. Amen? Um, we do want to take a moment this morning and we will um, pray to pray for those especially in the Vancouver um, Coastal Health Region and also in the Fraser Health Region because the restrictions that came out in the announcement yesterday do impact the way in which um, churches can operate. They can still gather, that's our understanding, um, but uh, when it comes to uh, small groups and, and that kind of thing, um, that's restricted for them. So we do want to keep them in our prayers, and we appreciate your prayers for us as we continue to lead you to the best of our ability. Um, we talked last week about Deborah Doyle and her situation. Thank you to all of you that have contributed. The church did give her a gift from the uh, Benevolent Fund for $500. Some of you um, contributed last week as well. Um, so thank you for that. We're going to keep the love offering for her open for another Sunday or two. Um, we're really delighted to say to you that she has accommodation up until the 19th of December and she was just able to secure a place from December 19th to January 1st and then she will be able to move into a house. The insurance company is providing the uh, rent for her and she'll be able to rent a house for the next two years while her place is being rebuilt. So we're just delighted at how faithful God is supplying for her and uh, happy to be able to share that news with you. And she's extremely grateful for your generosity and care and kindness toward her. If you want to contribute, uh, you can take an offering envelope and you can just simply write Deb or Deb Doyle on that and then we'll make sure that those donations um, reach her. So thank you once again. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're hoping to have communion. So just to uh, give that uh, news to you, um, we, uh, we look forward to that. And for those of you that watch online, well, you can have your elements ready um, there at home. Okay, let's just take a moment and uh, pray together. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we're so grateful that we are able to meet like this. We want to pray, Father, that you would continue to help us to be careful, to um, do what is right and best for everyone, to make sure that we do all that we can to ensure the health and safety of others. Father, I just simply want to pray because I know there is so much fear and worry uh, and anxiety that is out there that, Father, we would recognize where fear comes from that has no place within our lives or hearts as God's people. And so, Father, we just pray that you would enable us to be able to face these days with faith, with courage, and with you. So, God, I just pray that we would um, consider and take to heart what Jim shared with us, that when we feel surrounded by all the things that are going on in our world, that we would know that you have everything surrounded and you hold us in your more than capable hands. We're grateful for your presence here this morning, thankful for your presence that is always with us everywhere. And so, Father, we're grateful that you are faithful and true to your word. We want to pray today, Father, for those that are in the midst of cancer journeys. We think especially of Margo, of Barry, and Myrna. Father, we continue to pray that you would give to them grace and strength. God, we continue to pray for your healing touch on each of these dear individuals. We just lift them to you. We want to pray for a member of our community today, for Mariana. Father, she has given so much of herself and her time to the community of Summerland, and as she has now been diagnosed with this rare medical condition, Lord Jesus, would you enable her to be able to breathe, something that we take so easily for granted. Lord, this disease that uh, attacks the lungs, 
We want to pray in Jesus' name for your healing for her. God, would you just come around and care for her and just let her know that she's loved, appreciated, and thought of in these days. And so, God, we just lift her to you. For the people of Vancouver Coast and for the Fraser Health Lord, we pray for them today. We pray that they would be able to get on top of the spread of this virus and to be able to change the trajectory of what's happening. We pray, Father, that right across this province, right across this nation, right across the world, Father, we pray that we would begin to see these numbers decline and go down and that uh, we would just see all of the measures that are being put in place uh, working. Father, we thank you that, again, um, we can trust you, and I pray for those that are giving us messages that you would help them to speak with clarity so that we can understand. We just are grateful for Deb and how you are um, taking care of her, and we just want to pray that you would continue to encourage her in these days to give her rest as she works through the whole process of replacing all the things that she lost. Thank you for coming around her. God, as we continue on with Psalm 23, Continue to speak into our lives. We pray these things in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And we all sit together. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, Psalm 23, verse 4, says this. And I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. Uh, you may see this on the PowerPoint, just in the introductory uh, PowerPoint that is provided. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Could you say that with me? I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. What a word for November the 8th, 2020, right? Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. In going through Psalm 23, verse 4 marks a change. It may seem kind of subtle or a, a, a little um, slight, but there is a shift here. And the first one is in location. Up until now, the shepherd has been rather stationary. He lets the sheep rest in green meadows. He leads them beside peaceful streams and quiet waters. He refreshes and restores them. That has been going on as we've been looking at the first three verses. But verse 4 is moving day. It's time to take the sheep to the high country. And the shepherd leads the flock to the mountains. The shepherd has no choice in this. Because as the uh, pasture is being eaten and consumed down below, it's time to move up to the higher lush alpine meadows. And so the shepherd takes his sheep up into the grasses of the hillsides where they will graze until autumn. They'll stay up there until the grass is gone. And the chill of more wintry weather, like November, forces them back down to lower pastures once again. You know, um, two sources that have been very helpful as I've been preparing for this is Philip Keller's book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and Max Licato's book, Traveling Light. Now, not all shepherds make this journey. It's a long journey and it's dangerous. There are poisonous plants, there are wild animals, there are narrow trails with sharp drop-offs, there's dark valleys, but for the sake of the sheep, the shepherd does it. And maybe there's a picture. There is um, the promised land landscape at its finest. <laughs> you can see the valley and you can see the shadows. And you can see how if they are navigating those narrow trails along those steep edges, what it's like for the shepherd to lead a sheep through that as they make their way to greener pastures. They'll go up into the high country and then back down into the low country later on. Now also, in verse 4, there's a shift in tone. All of a sudden, this becomes more personal with the pronouns I and you which enters the conversation here. So this becomes an even more intimate discourse revealing the deep affection between the sheep and the shepherd. This is all natural and it's normal. The long treks into the high country with their summer range begin and the summer will be spent in close companionship 
and solitary care of the Good Shepherd. Now, both in Palestine and also in our western sheep ranches, this division of the year is common. Most of the efficient shepherds endeavor to take their flocks onto distant summer ranges during the summertime, and it often entails a long cattle drive. The sheep move along slowly, feeding as they grow as they go, and gradually working their way uh, behind the receding snow. And by late summer, they're well into these remote alpine meadows. With the approach of autumn, they'll make their way back down into the valley. And the shepherd will just move them back, coming back through the same route that they would have taken as they were making their way up. And during this time, as they travel, the flock is entirely alone with the shepherd. They're in intimate con contact with him and under his most personal attention day and night. And that is why these last verses, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6, are couched in the most intimate of first-person language. Every mountain has its valleys, right? Its sides are scarred by deep ravines and gulches and draws. And the best route to the top is always along these valleys. And any shepherd familiar with the high country knows that. And so they try and lead their sheep as gently as they can, but persistent in leading them up the paths that wind through the dark valleys. Oh, isn't that interesting? You and I also have a journey to make. We journey from the cradle to the grave. And there are highs and lows, and there are mountaintop experiences, and there are valleys. There are narrow pathways, and there are wide, smooth pathways. There's peril and danger. There are enemies and evil. There are peaceful streams, quiet waters, and green meadows. The question is, how well will we travel? You see, even for the shepherd, there was reason to be afraid. And there's reason for us to be afraid as well. And let me just iterate something that I have said before. We're careful, not fearful. We're careful, not fearful. There is no place within God's people for fear. Fear does not come from our Heavenly Father. So we are careful, but not fearful. Now, let me flip that a little bit and say this as well. We're people of faith, but not careless. We're people of faith, but not careless. We are not autonomous, but dependent. We are not arrogant, but we are bold. We are not fearful, but we are courageous. Let me ask you this question this morning. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? For those of you that are watching, what is your fear? Name your fear. And here's the deal. You can't face your fear if you won't name it. You need to name it. You need to identify it so that you can face it. What is it that you're afraid of? Is it heights or spiders or snakes? Is it small spaces or perhaps even the dark? If it's none of those, how about something like this? How about loneliness or rejection or being unable to provide for your family? Or maybe it's a fill in the blank like, I am not good enough or I am not rich enough or I am not talented enough. Maybe I'm not pretty or handsome enough. Maybe it's a fear of infecting someone or being infected yourself. And as we come into Psalm 23, verse 4, perhaps it's the greatest fear of all, the fear of death, the fear of dying. How do we fight or face our fears? Well, on a PowerPoint, there are several things here. The first one, I just want to give you 10 verses that you can reference that just help us in order to fight or face the fears that we may have. Here are the 10 verses. You'll see them right up there. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. How about Psalm 56, verse 3? 
When I am afraid, I will trust in you. How about Deuteronomy 31, verse 8? He will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. How about John 14, verse 27? Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. This would be a good place to say an amen, right? Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do for me? And the 10th verse. Psalm 23, verse 4. Now, I know that for most of us, we have memorized this in the King James Version. Am I right? So in the other version, it's like, oh, I can't remember that one. But I'm guessing that all of us could say Psalm 23, verse 4 in the King James Version. Are you ready? Let's say it together. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Ah. It is good for us to just push pause. Push pause. Take a minute and just rest beside a peaceful or quiet stream. Just rest in a green meadow with all of the messages and everything that is swirling around us how easy is it to be overwhelmed it is so easy but just like Jim was reminding us just to take our eyes and to put them where they need to be to keep our thoughts and our minds and our focus on the Lord Jesus himself you see, when the sheep would lose sight of the shepherd, they would easily wander away. And it was easy for them then to be isolated and to find themselves in trouble. But when their eyes were on the shepherd, then they were able to stay with the flock. They would be safe and protected and cared for. Margot reminded us that she likes to say Psalm 91. Uh, several times a day. Here's my thinking on, on uh, verses like Psalm 91. If God had not given us a psalm like that, why wouldn't he want us to put it into practice? If he didn't mean these words, he could have just left them out. But he gave us psalms like Psalm 91 for a reason. Now, I simply want to just walk us through the entire psalm, just to read through it. It's on the PowerPoint behind me. It's in the New Living Translation. Just follow along as I read. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that great? This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. That's a huge thing in these days. How much do we trust our God? How much do we trust our shepherd? How much do we believe that He is exactly what He said He is? Verse 3, For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with His feathers. How comforting is that? He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes. 
and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home. Verse 11. For He will order His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen? Wow. Yeah. Meditate on that for a while. Can I come back to something that I said earlier? Well, we are careful, not fearful. We are people of faith, but not careless. We are not autonomous, but dependent. We are not arrogant, but bold. We are not fearful, but courageous. If you notice in those passages out of Deuteronomy, what's happening here is a transition in leadership. Moses has died. Joshua is going to step in. And so Joshua is replacing probably the greatest leader that Israel ever knew. And so all of a sudden, you can imagine what it was like for him to step into those shoes. He's afraid, and he has reason to be afraid, as he now inherits the leadership mantle of this nation. And God continues to say to Joshua over and over and over again, be strong and of a good courage. Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. People of God, be strong and of a good courage. For I, the Lord your God, am with you wherever you go. Amen? The shepherd promises to be with his flock through the high mountain treks and through the valleys, along the narrow paths and through the wide paths. The shepherd promises to be with us. How well will we travel? How well will we travel? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, for the shepherd, it was important that they packed light. And so every piece that they took with them had to have a purpose. And the rod and the staff were two things that the shepherd would carry with him that he had made from the time he was a boy. He would find a stick that was perfectly suited to him. He would whittle that down and he would make it. The rod, basically the rod served as, as, as a form of defense and as a form of discipline. If there was anything that was coming to attack the sheep, the shepherd could take the rod and he would throw it. If it was in close proximity, he would throw it at whatever was coming to attack the sheep and drive it away. And if he needed to uh, use the rod to pull a sheep back into a plate, he could just get them back in the line. The same with the staff. The staff was also used to guide and, and keep the sheep in line. Thus you had the shepherd's crook. You had that hook on the end. I was kind of hoping, Benjamin, that you had yours today. <laughs> Benjamin makes the best shepherd, okay? It's awesome. And he has that staff. And that's just a reminder of how gently the shepherd pulls us back, keeps us in line, instructs and guides, and makes sure that we're safe. I was just wondering about this. When David wrote, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, what is the rod and the staff? that God himself uses. I think it's one and the same. I think it's the word of God. I think it's the word of God because the word of God defends us and guards us. It protects us and cares for us. It leads us and guides us. It directs and corrects and instructs us. I think the word of God is the staff and the rod. It's comforting. It's comforting to know the shepherd cares enough for us that he would do that for us. Max Licato in his book, Traveling Light, reminds us of two very important things. And as I bring this message to a close, here they are. Number one, we all have to face death. We all have to face it. 
Number two, we don't have to face death alone. We don't have to face it alone. Now what's really amazing to me is that Jesus, who is the Good Shepherd, can relate to us right through our own journey. Where does the Shepherd Jesus relate to the journey that you and I are on? Well, when you think about when He went to the cross, and you think about what He suffered, and the agony that He experienced when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, do you remember the prayer that Jesus prayed? Father, if there was any other way, if there is any other way, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. As Jesus agonized before he went to the cross, he went through his own struggle and his own wrestling through that valley of the shadow of death. He understands what you're going through. He understands every fear. He's been there. He's felt what you feel. He identifies and relates exactly with what you're experiencing in this moment. He knows you full well. He made you. He created you. He died for you. He redeemed you. He calls you by name. You are His. Amen? Wow. So on this last PowerPoint slide, John 14, verses 1 to 3. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God or trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? It's true. I am going to prepare a place for you. We are on this journey from the cradle to the grave. We are making our way to His home. That's where He is leading us. And then He said, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That's the hope for God's people. That's the promise, the blessed hope that the shepherd Jesus Himself gives to His sheep. Hallelujah. Amen. So here's my question for all of you that are here and for those that may watch this online. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is he your shepherd? If there was any doubt in your mind, if you're not sure, you can be sure today. You can be sure today. If you've wandered away, he welcomes you back. His arms are open wide. All, he, all He's waiting for is for you just to say, Yes, Lord Jesus. I want you. I need you. I just want to feel your arms and your embrace around me once again. You can do that. You can say that right here. Right where you're seated. Right where you're seated if you're watching online. Wherever you may be. You can say yes to the invitation of the shepherd for you in this very moment. Jim and Anna are going to lead us in one final song. They're going to come as they're coming. Let's pray together. Oh God, how grateful we are that we can trust you. You are faithful and true to your promises. And I pray, Father, wherever we are on our journey of understanding with you, I pray, Father, that we would know that yes, Lord Jesus, you are my shepherd. You have created me. You have died for me. You have redeemed me. You have called me my name, my name. I belong to you. You are my Lord and my Savior. You are my shepherd. So, Father, thank you for your faith. Thank you for loving us. And as you continue to extend the invitation to us, I just pray that we would come home to you. For I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? And we're just going to sing in, uh, one final song. Jim and Anna will lead us. Thanks. One of the things that is so <clears throat> heavenly about Jesus, something that so often is unlike us, yet is something that, oh God, I wish we would be, and I wish I would be, is... Um, just welcoming you, gracious, to all. That 
the people that Jesus welcomed into his life, that they that he welcomed to his table, that he um, was invited to their table, or that he welcomed into conversation with him and fellowship with him, uh, were all sorts, uh, from all walks of life, from all conditions of the heart and soul, and, and everything. And um, I love that about Jesus. I know that I've experienced that grace from him, that there are times where the best faith that I can muster is I kind of believe, but help me <laughs> where I don't. And yet he's still welcome. And so whatever state I know that we find ourselves in, uh, Jesus is gracious. And so as we sing, uh, Come As You Are, I think not only is an invitation to us, but it's also uh, a beautiful um, reminder and indicator of the heart of the God that we worship. The dwelling is the Oh, so. 
I just want to thank Jim and Anna for leading us so well. Thank you for being with us this morning. And for those of you that watch online, thanks for doing that as well. If you have any questions or want to talk, I'll just stay here at the front. If you want to message me, if you're watching online, feel free to do that. But we trust that you know Jesus as your shepherd. God bless you. We'll see you again next week. Bye for now.